All right, guys, it's book report time. <laughs> and um, you may be wondering, what the heck has he got in this background? For those of you who are unaware, you've heard of the Green Berets, the Special Forces in the Army. Well, this is their emblem um, that you will see on their on the actual beret. And um, the stripe that you see, well, I guess I should do it this, <laughs> this way, is for the fifth group. Funny thing is, I learned that just recently, a couple few years ago, from a former boss, dear friend of mine, who spent time in Vietnam as a Special Forces Green Beret. And much respect to him. Always let him know anytime I see him about that. Uh, the book, and the reason why all of this, why I'm describing all of that, is called Full Battle Rattle, okay? This dude is one badass. Oh my God, he's incredible. His name is Changiz Lahiji. I believe that's how it's pronounced, Lahiji. Um, he's actually Iranian and <clears throat> spent 24 years in uh, the Special Forces. And um, I just, uh, before I kind of really tell you a little bit about the story of the book, uh, it's an easy, it's a good read. It's an interesting read, fascinating read. Um, I rarely will I mention the kind of like the the intro little liner page here, but he he uh, has a quote here with the Spartan Queen, the Spartan King, quoted by through 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 uh, well the Spartan King who is quoted here. Um, the nation that makes a great distinction between its scholars and its warriors will have its thinking done by cowards and its fighting done by fools. I thought that was interesting. And then he uh, kind of did, dedicates it to all the brave individuals who have ever served in the United States Special Forces. De opreso liber, to free the oppressed. Pretty cool, right? Um, I know, I actually know a few folks who are who've been in in, in that. But so <clears throat> this book, uh, I have, I've had it for a little while, and I finally read it. And um, it was I, you just I couldn't li couldn't put it down. It was really good. He's a guy that, like I said, he's from Iran, and. Um, he talks a little bit about if you're old enough, or maybe you're not. <laughs> in in 1980, 79 actually, around 79. Prior to that, you had the Shah of Iran, who was the ruler of the country, and all of a sudden he gets really sick. So the president at the time was Jimmy Carter, and he has uh, the Shah come to the United States to. Uh, try to help him with his illness. Uh, I think he had cancer or something like that. And he was kind of oppressing his people to, you know, in, in many ways. In, in other ways, uh, they were more liberal to do things. Uh, women could dress in Western clothing. In other words, an actual dress and without any head covering and that type of thing. But folks like Ayatollah Khomeini came in around that time and started gaining power uh, with the people because it was like, you know, we got to, we got to get more freedom, et cetera, et cetera. And around that time when the Shah was taken to the United States, then all of a sudden um, there's a little bit of a power vacuum because all of a sudden they start protesting and they took over the American embassy at 52, uh, folks that were in the embassy uh, were held there for, I think it was like 493 days, almost 500 days. And um, 
for those of you who have, eh, who probably could remember if you're around my age, you remember Nightline, the TV show. Uh, that would happen if you were in central time zone, you'd have the news at 10 o'clock, 1030, you might have, um, you know, NBC would have uh, the Tonight Show, but ABC would put, you know, Nightline, and they would talk about, it would be, I think it was Frank Reynolds on ABC, uh, you know, talking about day whatever, hostage crisis. And of course, uh, they held out until uh, the last days of Carter's uh, administration. And then when Reagan was elected, then they let them, let them out and all 52 came back. Now, I kind of give you a little precursor on that, right? So what happens is, and around that time, he's got some family members and he knows that whole area. Um, and he, uh, it's pretty fascinating because he became a U.S. citizen. You know, he loves America. I mean, this guy, um, let me see if I can remember exactly when he got here, but I can't remember exactly. Phone's going off. <laughs> uh, but the, uh, he was asked, he was in, he had trained, he had, he had, he had been in, in, in training, he'd become, went into, uh, joined the U.S. military, uh, trained in the special forces, um, and he talks about his training and when he was in the special forces, especially around that period of time, this between 74 and 79, and how some people uh, and through the year, a few years after that, how they would look at him and <laughs> suspiciously, even in the military, because of the way he looked, uh, because he, he's Iranian and um, certainly not the right thing. And he's, he gets pissed. He talks about how pissed off he was. But there were certain uh, commanders that were very much defending of him. And uh, my, my hat's off to those. And during the time of the hostage crisis, he actually helped check, uh, went scouting around in, in Tehran, in Tehran, I guess is how it's pronounced. Um, and he talks about the mission that was supposed to go into uh, per getting the hostages out. And he describes what happened when the helicopters went down and that big crash happened, and they had to they, they had to uh, cancel the mission uh, because they had a mission that were going to go in and try to save the uh, the hostages. Um, he talks about um, working in in Pakistan. He go and in Beirut and Beirut around the time uh, again. I think it was in '83 when the the the, the M, not the uh, the barracks. The Marine barracks, I think it was like over 238 uh, Marines that were killed in a bombing of the, bar uh, the barracks. He talks about his experience being in Beirut during that time. And that was part of, uh, I believe Beirut was having a civil war. Uh, Muslim uh, Lebanese and Christian Lebanese fighting each other. Um, and, and in all honesty, Lebanon when you look at the geography, it's a beautiful country. And I remember as a child going there with my family, uh, 73, maybe four, beautiful country. Went to Baalbek, which was awesome. Just some of the old ruins and even went up into the mountains. Um, talks about his experience in, in Grenada when the U.S. went into Grenada. He's like, eh, okay, whatever. It wasn't much of a big deal, even though a lot of people made a big deal over it as far as he was concerned as a, uh, <laughs> a guy in the special forces. Um, then he describes his experience in the Far East in the first Gulf War. 24 years is pretty amazing to be in this type of a military group, whether it's the Navy SEALs or the... Uh, or airborne army rangers or uh, green berets because 
as he described it through the whole book, he talks about different situations where he got hurt. And you're thinking, oh, my God, if I had gone through that, I, I would have said, all right, I'm done. Uh, pretty amazing guy. Uh, amazing in strength of mind, strength of heart, and physical strength as well. Um, he was a guy that certainly knew Farsi, being Iranian, and he knew Arabic as well. So through each story, each each section, each chapter, he talks about dealing with, oh, uh, opportunities. And he was like, yeah, I'll go. <laughs> Always the first in line to go. Uh, and <clears throat> pretty amazing guy, though. Uh, I actually know uh, somebody who's met him, and he was, he said he's a hell of a guy, very dynamic. Um, uh, and after his experience in the Special Forces, he, um, he, he worked as a contractor, and he talks about that, which is interesting, because we hear about these contractors in Iraq or Afghanistan, uh, all these other countries that we've been in. And, and it's interesting how he talks about how some of them uh, really, the good and the bad and the ugly about the whole situation uh, certainly tells his opinion on, on why are they doing this or doing that as far as certain decision making. And it is all about hearts and minds. And he, he kind of mentions that. Um, but um, if, I don't know if you remember, not too, uh, several years ago, uh, maybe less than 10 years ago, uh, there was a situation where some contractors, uh, there was a convoy and one of the vehicles had been uh, uh, attacked by this group of people. And um, I, I, I don't remember if it was burned or, uh, well, it was burned, but I don't remember if they, uh, um, destroyed the vehicle or not they he was in that convoy and they were in the last vehicle these contractors uh, and when they were killed and bodies burned and mutilated those are the ones that were dragged around that you saw in the news which was really horrible um and uh, he talks a little bit about that so it, it's an amazing book pretty intense he talks about his experiences um and, and you know what's really uh, awesome about this guy? Every part he talks about throughout the book, it's about his love for this country, which is just so cool. He passionately loves this country. And, uh, but then, and, and also love being able to represent this country in, in uniform. And it was touching to read that and to see that. And it's like, uh, I'm not even originally from this country, but I love this country and I want to defend this country. And I thought it was really cool. Um, it's a great book. Like I said, the interesting thing is this picture right here, and it shows him and uh, kind of smiling a little bit, but if you look at a, a close up of it, uh, there's some blood and he had just gotten out of the helicopter behind him that had been shot at and blown. And uh, the pilot and one of the guys in there with the pilot uh, were killed. And he was lucky he, was, he didn't get killed. Pretty amazing stories. Uh, he's the longest serving Special Forces A-team soldier in American history. Um, Changiz Lahiji. Uh, it's a great book if you want to learn about um, you know, one's life being in that, that kind of a work or career. Um, and he, he's, I, I like this point of view because he, he, he doesn't sugarcoat things. Um, there were things he's like, what the hell are they, what are they thinking, you know? Um, and he did, did talk about hearts and minds. If you ever get a chance, uh, it was the first thing, the first time I ever heard the term was from an uncle who was in the uh, U.S. Army in the 70s, and he talked about hearts and minds. Well, there was actually a documentary movie about that, about Vietnam, but it's all about hearts and minds, and what that means is you win the hearts and minds of people. Uh, 
And when you go into another country to help them out, if you can win their hearts and minds in the process, it makes things so much easier. So it's like, okay, we win the war, but we can't win the peace, you know? So it makes it a little nutty. Um, but without getting deep into the lane of politics, it's, again, it's about uh, 270, 75 pages long. Uh, it's actually a pretty easy read. Each chapter talks about different, you know, the first chapter talks about Tehran and the situation with the hostages. Then the next chapter talks about his, uh, his childhood. And, uh, it, you know, you're a guy who's passionately cares about his family. One of the sad things that he talks about, uh, I believe it was an uncle that um, during the Khomeini regime, he went to go visit him and he finds him uh, dead and had been dead for several days. Um, Khomeini's people had gone to this guy's, his uncle's uh, apartment, gone in, basically beat him up, killed him and threw him out the building. And he just laid there, uh, pretty, pretty sad. Um, so it, it, there's some intense stuff in here, but it's a very good read, uh, very eye-opening. I'm not going to say it's uh, you know a fun book to read necessarily. It's an educational book to read. Uh, pretty intense, um, but his viewpoint is pretty amazing. And again, the part that I, I really love is a guy who came to this country, um, still proud to serve in his country, uh, loved it with all his heart, and and yet. There are certain things he he just says, hey, I didn't like this or didn't like that, because he talks about several situations where uh, even soldiers in in that didn't really know who he was in his unit. For instance, he's in an airport, I believe, in North Carolina, and uh, the cops there at the at the airport. Um, he had a he was he was going on a mission. He had a, a new pistol that he had bought. He had it registered, and instead of saying putting it in his suitcase and checking it in that way and saying, hey, I have a pistol, it's in the gun, and blah, 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 and it's going under the plane, and, and that's it, he had it with him, and so when they saw that, they throw him against the wall, and they're, you know, basically getting ready to go ballistic on him, and um, he kept telling him, Here's my papers. This is why I'm going. This is why I have it. I am a soldier, you know, I'm a soldier in the special forces. And um, it, it really uh, disturbed me to hear that that was going on. But at the same time, you understand, to some extent, you go, well, you know, <laughs> you're finding a gun at this time of day. It, you kind of go yes and no on that type of a situation. You're like, uh. but um, a gentleman who was part of Fort Bragg had been close by and helped get that taken care of. And uh, um, his attitude, I love the guy's attitude. So to end this book report, Full Battle Rattle by Changiz Lahiji. It's the story, his story about serving in the special forces, a team uh, for the, he's the longest serving in the, in the American history. All right, hopefully you enjoyed this. Uh, check it out at your friendly bookstore. Thanks a lot.